doing? You know, could you improve maybe the planning aspect or your demeanor or you know any aspect of that? And it's important to constantly think about what we're doing. Is there something we can do differently? I know I am. I want to be the best teacher I can be, and I only do that by reflecting on on what I'm doing poorly on that I need to improve and the things that I think I do pretty well. The second session is um, going to be where the rubber meets the road. And it's going to be some, some, some specifics uh, about what I think are common band performance problems. And these are just observations that I've had from my own groups for guest conducting honor bands or um, adjudicating. You know, when you hear bands and you, bands come through and you say, you know, I'm giving a lot of comments like this, and I'm giving a lot of comments like this. These bands have a lot of the, the same sort of problem areas. So um, I'm, I'm going to go rather quickly because there's a, there's a lot to touch on, and if I need to repeat something or, or slow down, just let me know. I'm going to start with sound and sound concepts because I think all great things musical come out of a great sound. And that should be the foundation of what we do as musicians and as conductors. Um, I believe that, that musicians should always strive to produce their best, their most beautiful sound. And that's from percussion that are back there playing a wood block with a snare stick. It's not a great sound. Or maybe um, a trumpet player that's playing with a really bright sound or, or whatever. But we should aspire to create the most beautiful sounds possible. Our musicians' most important contribution to the band is the, the quality of their sound. So I, I spend a lot of time in my rehearsal nurturing the sound of our band. I have a certain concept in my mind based on what Jim Suttup did at Texas Tech. That was my background. That's the sound that I, I grew up with and the sound that I seek to, to achieve with my band. And um, I find it's the area that often is the most neglected in band performance. I think too many conductors just sort of take what the band gives them. There's not this nurturing of, okay, let's work on blending. Let's work on creating a certain balance or a certain sort of on composite ensemble sound. Often when I'm judging, it seems like there's, there's been no attention made to, to the ensemble sound. The kids come in and play, and there's just nothing there. And frankly, I don't care if I agree or disagree with your concept of the ensemble sound. I think of a, a sound like Eddie Green at the University of Houston. I didn't particularly like the sound of that band. It was very different than Texas Tech. But it's fine to disagree. It was a concept that he taught. It tended to be brighter. They used C trumpets in the band. It was just a brighter approach to band that I liked. But I respected it as someone's opinion. But he worked to achieve a certain sound. What I have a problem with is just neglecting it altogether. So we've got to have a concept. What do you want the group to sound like? And then how are you going to get there? So the first, the first step is developing that concept. For me, it's the Texas Tech Symphonic Band when I was a member of that group. That's the sound that I, I like, I respect it, and that I teach toward. Concepts are different. As I mentioned, the Eastman Wind Ensemble has a different concept of sound. Indiana, whatever, or maybe a really strong high school band or middle school band that you listen to, they, they have different concepts of sound, but they're teaching toward those, those concepts. I do not view concepts as right or wrong, just concepts that I, you know, that I prefer or don't. Generally, the bands that I hear tend to be bright and loud. And I encourage conductors to approach sound more from a position of darkness, round, beautiful. I think bands approach too much from the, the other side, the bright, the aggressive side, and it's really difficult to work back from that position. So I would rather work from trying to achieve a beautiful, round, elegant sound and then brighten as needed. John Mackey, he requires some really aggressive effects in his music. Um, bright, 
you know, blasting, blaring, you know, kids just love that. I see my trombone's eyes light up. Here we go. Right? Yeah, that's what he wants. You know, and they'll put the hammer down and then they'll look at me. That's, I know, that's what he wants. But then we work back. And so think about round, we, our bands play too loudly. You want to have the ability to, to drop the hammer when you need to and to achieve that power but we approach our sound from a point where it's just too bright and too loud. So I have to, this is my job. Kids are gonna do what I ask them to do, so I have to monitor their volume. It, our baseline mezzo forte is too loud. Get it down, round the edges, blend your sound, make a beautiful sound. Um, symphonic band yesterday, I asked them, I said, okay, make your, Play with your most beautiful sound. And once students are thinking about that, just instantly, I thought the quality changed. And it's just reminding them, imagine the best trombone sound. Great, now make that sound. If they think about it, then they will come closer to doing it. But that's our job, is to, to help them. Percussionists, from my experience, always tend to grab the hardest mallets in their bag at the very beginning. Again. Go the other way. Don't start from the brightest, most articulate. Start from the darkest options. And then, no, that's not quite articulate enough. Can you either change the technique or the mallets and let's get better definition. But with percussion, start from the same idea of darkness, produce the most resonant sound on that bass drum, the snare drum, or marimba. But they, and I have to remind mine all the time, they come out with the most, the hardest mallet they can. Is, it, is that? The most fun to play with? Why are you doing that? Um, a conductor without a sound concept for their ensemble is like a trumpet or oboe player with no sound concept for that instrument. Can't have it. When I was growing up as a player, I wanted to sound like Maurice Andre. I do not sound like Maurice Andre, unfortunately, but that was my model. That's the sound of, the, of that is a beautiful sound. So our students have to have those concepts in their mind just like we do. I want this group to sound like the Bergner High School Band or whatever your, your concept would be and then teach toward that. But if you don't have that, then it's going to be directionless in terms of what you're molding your ensemble toward. Uh, you could use recordings of excellent high school bands from New Mexico, Midwest Clinic, wherever, and say this is a high school band, not a college band. This is a high school band or an excellent middle school band. What do you think about their sound? What do you what do you hear? My developmental work occurs during the initial phase of the rehearsal, as I, I mentioned earlier. I don't really consider consider that the warm up, but that's that's typically what we call it. As I mentioned, sometimes I begin with breathing exercises. Bands do not breathe well. Players do not breathe well. And so if I'm monitoring my band or the band, it's not my band, the band, and I'm noticing their they're giving poor effort on breathing, then sometimes I'll say, okay, stand, we're gonna breathe, and just remind them we've got to get some air moving. How many of you use breathing exercises regularly with your band? Okay, gotta do them. And I, I, I don't think we can take 10 or 15 minutes to do it, but two or three minutes and suddenly you've got the air moving, now let's apply that to what you're doing. But I just noticed that players do not breathe and manage air as, as well as they can. So we've got to make sure they understand the importance of that. Then I'll go into long tones, scales, scales and around, scales and thirds, fourths, Remington, ascending, descending, um, woodwinds ascending, brass descending, groups one and four. I mix all of that up. So again, there's there's variety and contrast within a routine. But I want this to sensitize, help sensitize the students to the, my conducting and to the sound that they're making as a band. I don't, don't want them looking initially at a bunch of fast notes and playing and worried about fingers. I want them worried about thinking about their sound and about sound production, blending, and just producing a beautiful baseline ensemble sound. Also, I mentioned in that part it's important that I look at their eyes and that's just basically a welcoming you know, thank you Cameron for being here, that kind of thing. We just, we know that. We just look at each other's eyes and we make that acknowledgement and that's, that's an important connection for me. 
I expect everyone um, to, do, to deliver their best sound. This is where you can imagine the director, the scale. Everybody plays the scale. There's nothing about that at all. So I expect when we warm up, we start the long tones, that they are going to deliver the very best sound that they can. I'm also going to deliver the most expressive conducting that I can. I cannot expect them to play expressively on a scale if I have my hand in my pocket and I just give a, a halfway committed gesture. I'm going to look at them. This is going to be like, like performing Elsa's procession to the cathedral <coughs> together. And we are very serious about what we're doing and making beautiful music on a concert at scale. There's a, there's a seriousness of intent there. And, and if they're not playing with their best sound, we will stop, we'll talk about it, and then we'll do it again. So we'll try to set a high expectation early and keep everyone focused and contributing at their highest level at all times. Avoid starting right away with some exercise from a book or the music. I don't know, and I have colleagues that disagree with me, and that's great, that's what's exciting about music. I don't know how you lay the foundation of the sound of your ensemble if you go right away to a piece of music. I don't think you can, for me, I don't know how I could do that. I want to establish the baseline outside of that and then apply that within a, a piece of music. If this part of the rehearsal becomes too routine and predictable, the students will shut off. So you want to find a way to reinforce these concepts within a creative way. And there, there are many different ways to do that, but I like to keep my students guessing a little bit. They know we're going to start with some kind of long tone, but they don't know what. And they do know we'll end with a chorale. Sometimes I have them transpose a chorale. You could have your students transpose a chorale, just take it down a step. Then you see the woodwind with eyes at what, what, what are, you, what are you asking us to do? And it's freak out time. Just take it down a step. Get an easy corral. Just take it down a step. And suddenly the wheels are spinning at a very fast rate. Take it up a step. Especially if I notice they're not very well focused. That's, a, that's more of a focus routine or technique for me than anything else. But you should say, like, what? And then it really just turns out to be a pretty good rehearsal most of the time. The culmination of that developmental part of the, the rehearsal is a chorale. And there are many excellent collections. Um, I use the Wayne Border Sound Training Chorale book, and um, I also use the 16 Bach Chorales by Mayhew Lake. I have two books, again, like I had two technique books with my high school bands, just because I don't want them I don't want us exhausting all the chorales in one book, and that's so we play number 12 out of the Mayhew Lake book 80 times that year. So I've got two books, I can go back and forth, they are scored quite differently. And I'll mix things up, like I saw Mr. Seifert do yesterday, which was beautiful. Okay, this phrase, one in four. And often I'll have the inside voices sing their parts or hum. Okay, now let's hear the groups two and three. Outside voices, you hum along and things like that. You can really mix and match and create different effects and compel them to listen in different ways. But you're, you're addressing sound, you're addressing intonation as you go. I will have the brass buzz the chorales on their mouthpieces. I do that commonly. I don't know if they like it, but they need to be able to do it. And so we'll have the brass buzz while the woodwinds play. I'll have the woodwinds sing while the brass play. I just try to mix it up again so they don't, they don't um, it's not too routine for them. I think an honest investment in this kind of work is going to pay off tremendous dividends in sound. One of the aspects of the Iowa Symphony Band that I'm the most proud is the sound we make. They make a nice sound because we work on it. And I think you can tell a difference from those bands that do and those uh, that don't. Don't ever let that part of the rehearsal just be perfunctory. Let's play the scale. It's just wasted time. Balance and blend. These are two other, they're related to sound, but they are different, and I, I often hear issues with it. You want to help students identify good ensemble balance according to your preferences. I use, growing up in West Texas, I came through the Macbeth system, the pyramid of balance. And on your handout, I put a chart, and, and this is probably familiar to most of you, but there's a chart that diagrams the um, or assigns the instruments into the different groups and I I do subscribe to this 
as a bless you as a baseline. Now there are going to be times when you're going to have um, you're going to want to change the balance. I don't think this is a one size fits all approach to ensemble balance. But as I said, it's a it's a very successful baseline from which to operate. There may be times when you're playing a march where your balance is going to be top and bottom heavy and not so much in the middle. So you're going to be balanced to the high voices, the group ones, and the group fours. You may be performing something that has more of a diamond. <coughs> so you bring, you balance to the, the mid ranges and not too much to the bottom or the, the highs. You may have something that's balanced to the highs and not the lows. You have to be the expert and you have to know. I don't think you can take the pyramid of balance and drop it in and it's going to work successfully for every piece. Maybe 8 out of 10, a lot of them. But you're going to have to think about, well in this case we're performing this march, okay, horns, alto saxes, trombones, less, flutes, clarinets, we need more of you, more of the tuba. You need to have that, that perspective. But I, again, I see balance, there's just no attention given whatsoever. And it, it's a major performance issue for, uh, for bands. Make sure that your part distribution reflects the pyramid approach to balance. When I assign parts, whether I'm conducting a 160-piece honor band, which I did two months ago in Illinois, or my own group, I always stack to the low parts. And we build up to reflect basically the distribution you see there, so that we're not we're not top heavy. If you overly dis distribute the parts to the top voices, you're going to have a tremendous challenge with achieving a good balance. You want to be sure that you encourage your inner parts to be confident. That really helps. Those second and third clarinet, second and third trumpet parts can add so much to the richness of the band sound, but they're often neglected. So you have a lot of first trumpet. And you know, your, your sections are built on, on the pyramid also. So if you have, you know, your trumpets are balanced, so when they're playing a chord, you want the third stronger than the second, the second stronger than the first. Then within the brass family, you have a pyramid of balance, and then within the entire band. And so you get this really nice, rich bottom balance approach to the band. If you distribute parts where you have more on first trumpet, fewer and fewer, it's problematic. So be sure those parts are distributed well. And I tell our librarians, if I don't give you the distribution, just weight it toward the bottom. So you always have more on the lower parts than at the top. There's a technique that I, um, I use. I used yesterday in Symphonic Band. I got this from Gary Smith. We're going to use it in here today to demonstrate. It's a really fast way to demonstrate um, the power of balance. So you're going to be our group ones and twos on this side. You're going to be our groups three and four. So you can, uh, groups three and four, Sing that. Group one and two, you can do an octave higher. Falsetto's cool. Hold it. Okay, stop. Good. So what I'm going to do then is... Okay. No, no. So when I raise this elbow, symphonic band people, remember this? Um, I want the group ones and twos to sing louder threes and fours to sing softer, we'll come back, then we're just going to change our, our balance. We're going to, I'll, I'll pull it down, let's do Fs. That'll help. Octave. Hold that. Quickly, I do this fast in honor bands when I don't have time to go through a 30 minute explanation of balance. And you remember that in symphonic band on how powerful that was on the chord that we held and how bright it got. And then we fattened it up over here 
So you might want to find some quick technique of it. All you're doing is changing the treble and bass within the band by using some kind of, of gesture to show them. If we add more highs than lows, then it's going to get bright, distorted. We're going to have more pitch problems. The sound's not going to be as good. Or if we turn up the bass like we do when we're listening to music, turn down the highs. So I think that's a... A, a very powerful technique that can quickly illustrate to your students and you can remind them ah, we, we need that chord in this position here are your bass and tenor voices here sopranos down here most of our groups probably play in this position it's just too much it's too much 20 flutes a lot of powerful trumpet you gotta, you gotta work them to get there I, I like that very quick very visually powerful Blend is another aspect that's related closely to balance. I think of balance as being largely in proportions, what you're balancing to, how much sound are the lows producing compared to the highs, what are you balancing to. Blend is this idea of uniformity of sound quality. And so uh, yesterday we had a, a blend issue in the symphonic band. I could hear there was a trombone player that was really popping out of the texture, and that was being created by... Um, the student was just playing too loudly in a, in a powerful section above the rest of the section. And so what we worked for was a more uniform sound where we balance and match volume. But blend is also affected by tone quality. So you could have a, a clarinet in the section. The entire section is playing with a really nice dark round sound. You have that one player is playing with an edgy sound and you're going to hear that player above the rest. That's a blend problem. It's not uniform. Poor intonation can cause a blend problem because someone is severely out of tune. You hear that trumpet player number three 